All right, let's start it off right with an exploit explanation of a zero-day vulnerability. So the background on this zero-day is that when an attacker would successfully break into Google Chrome using a different zero-day, if they found that they had landed on Windows, then they would use this vulnerability to privilege escalate. They had a separate privilege escalation zero-day if they happened to land in Google Chrome on an Android system. Now, the vulnerability itself was originally written up and detected by Kaspersky, but mostly what they wrote up was the exploit, not actual details of the core vulnerability in Windows itself, which meant that the Kaspersky write-up wasn't super useful to me to try to create an example for the class. However, a third-party researcher, Pyotr Florchik, documented his process of reverse engineering the Microsoft patch for the vulnerability, in the context of the Kaspersky write-up, and in so doing was able to figure out what the core vulnerability was, while at the same time creating his own proof-of-concept exploit for this thing that was being exploited in the wild. So I want to talk to you about reverse engineering, because normally in this class we obviously show the vulnerability before the exploit. But in this particular example, we're going to do the process in reverse. We're actually going to explain everything about the exploit, and in so doing we will eventually come to an understanding of the vulnerability. Now the reality here is that I could have tried to show you a bunch of pseudocode that uh, Piotr had provided on his post and said, you know, go find the flaw, but I decided that would be exceedingly difficult for you to look through all of the pseudocode that was incomplete in some cases. I also didn't want to go out and go grab the old Windows version and do the decompilation myself to make a better version of the pseudocode. So I thought that it would actually be useful for people, both our developer audience and our vulnerability hunter audience to see this process in reverse. So for the developers who, again, the reason why we even cover exploits in this class, the only reason is just so that developers understand that yes, people can really figure out how to exploit complicated things and it's just an engineering process like anything else. So you should always assume that vulnerabilities are exploitable. So for the developers, this will once again show a little bit more about how uh, attackers go about their process of creating exploits. And for the vulnerability hunters, of course, a lot of you want to eventually become uh, exploiters as well. And so this will give you a little bit of sort of a preview of how people go into making end day vulnerability like exploits. So basically an end day, again, is something where the patch is already out and the person wants to make an exploit. And so in that regard, it will actually serve as a little bit of a preview for a future class that KC wants to make, specifically focusing on on end day patch reverse engineering and exploitation. So I think it's good for everyone, even though we're gonna go a little bit in reverse here. So let's talk a little bit about background for Windows. Uh, this specific vulnerability is in the GDI or graphics device interface, which enables application to use graphics, blah, 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 blah. So it is a thing that deals with graphics, meaning bitmaps and windows and colors and text and all sorts of things. Now, for performance reasons, the GDI functionality exists in kernel space. So basically, all this manipulation of graphics, because it needs to be fast, it's going to be in the kernel. And so in practice, there is Win32 APIs that call through the GDI library, goes up to kernel space, and that does something to help manipulate graphics. But this particular interface, the GDI mechanism, is extremely complex and has been a source of many, many vulnerabilities over the years. And actually, because of that, attackers have reverse engineered many components of the system and know how to manipulate it very effectively for making new exploits from old exploits. So starting point for this discussion is that, you know, there's a lot of good details in one by Kaspersky about how the exploit works, but not what the vulnerability is. And so there, we're going to include a bunch of screenshots in this, uh, in this explanation from things like Ida Pro, which is a disassembler, and Hexrays, which is a decompiler. And it basically takes assembly and it turns it back into pseudocode. So vulnerability analysts use tools like these in order to get a sense of where the vulnerable code is by basically sitting in a debugger, feeding attacker-controlled input in, and then looking at the code where it flows to. So we're going to start from the Kaspersky exploit decompilation. So this is what this is all they gave. So they didn't give the full exploit details for obvious reasons, because otherwise uh, then, you know, it would make it that much easier for attackers to exploit in the wild. 
but of course it was already patched by the time they even talked about it so you know maybe it wouldn't have mattered that much so the first bit of stuff we see in this diagram is call to nt user set window long pointer and that seems to be at system call 1469 so they're doing something to set some data then they call create window x and this is going to be some sort of special create window x that has specific parameters that are going to be helpful for the invocation of the exploit there's going to be this toggle alt keys which the kaspersky folks said has to occur twice there has to be two toggling of the alt keys for the attacker to at actually reach the exploitable um, and vulnerable path that they care about then there's some stuff where we can see that the attacker would uh, set different set a value at different offsets and presumably this is depending on different windows versions that they want to exploit so if they're exploiting version one then they set an offset at negative 18 and if they're exploiting version two it's at negative 10. then there are again checks for you know what is the windows major version and it calls the system call nt user message call with different uh, system call offset for different windows version because system calls kind of move around and you're not supposed to know exactly what the system call number is you're supposed to just call through the libraries but of course exploits don't necessarily do that once again we have setting different values in bitmap based on something we don't know exactly what but presumably version information and then finally another call to this nt user message set call all right so that is the background what did uh, Piotr do to figure out where the actual vulnerability was well he started by using another tool called bindiff which works as a plugin to ida pro and that does a difference analysis between two binaries and it tries to find things that are similar so similarity score here if they're 100 percent similar well then we think that you know this thing at that offset is exactly the same code as this thing at that offset so we think they're the same function but uh, these initial things that have low similarity score meaning there's been changes between these windows versions they all have names like debug hook and so that seems like probably that is not going to be the vulnerability unless you know maybe microsoft left some debugging functionality in and the attacker exploited the debugging functionality but probably not so wouldn't tend to investigate those first and so what that leaves you with is a single function that changed everything else has 100 percent similarity or it was these things for debug hook we're excluding single function has changed it's 98 percent similar between the old version and the new version so that seems like something that maybe got a patch so when you actually look at the decompilation of this function it shows the only change was in variable initialization and that suggests it's new debug it basically if the old version versus the new version has new initialization that means they're fixing the fact that it was uninitialized in the old version so here's a bunch of stuff that's all the same so this thing at uh, 272 that's the 110 hex same data value being set and so the new insertions that exist in the new code is that gpsi plus 14e plus 154 and plus 180 at these locations they're now getting initialization that was missing in the older version so what would an attacker even do with that okay they know that some particular value is now initialized that wasn't before so how do they still find where the actual core OODA bug is well what you do is you would cross-reference the usage of these values in the unpatched code so you'd go off looking for where does the code use gpsi 14e 154 and 180 to find okay well there was some usage somewhere else that in the old code would have been uninitialized and now that's theoretically fixed and then of course you just have to read a bunch of the code that's what reverse engineering is all about and while cross references are a staple tool of the reverse engineer unfortunately they can't necessarily guarantee that a particular memory access will appear directly in the assembly code as a cross reference to that exact address you can imagine that you know if you're looping through an array the base address of the array might be found in the assembly code and then every subsequent access is actually a calculated access it's not always guaranteed that you're going to be able to find it and may require you know further in-depth analysis another natural question to ask right here would be what is this gpsi thing well the short answer is we don't know obviously this is not open source code uh, some sort of global variable probably and if we go and we search around the internet we can find references here saying it probably is a global pointer to server info uh, because it has a type p server info and so there's uh, some further sort of reverse engineered data structure definitions that you can find the links to on the website 
So you can do things with the debugger, you can do reverse engineering, but you can also do forward engineering. So you can iteratively create an exploit while you're looking at the results of the exploit in a debugger. And so you can go forward, you can go backwards, you know, you have to do kind of all of the above. And so that's what Piotr chose to do. So based on the Kaspersky write-up, he has a question of, you know, well, where do I start? And so there's an important statement in the Kaspersky write-up that reads as follows. At this step, the exploit tries to emulate the alt keys and then using a call to set bitmap bits, it crafts a GDI object which contains a controllable pointer value that is used later in the kernel driver's code. And then specifically it says in the kernel driver's code at win32k, which is the kernel driver, and the function is draw switch wind highlight. And it's saying that occurs after the exploit issues a second undocumented call to the system call nt user message call. That's how it gets an arbitrary kernel read write primitive. Okay, so from this, we know that the theoretical actual exploitation occurs and the actual usage of attacker control data occurs in draw switch window highlight. And so if one looks at where draw switch window highlight is called, there's only two choices. It's either called from XXX move switch window highlight or XXX paint switch window. So then the reverse engineer would go look at those two functions and see which they think is more likely. But inside of XXX paint switch window, there is two references to get key state. And so this suggests that perhaps this is the thing that has to do with that statement of the attacker needing to toggle the alt key twice. Therefore, you know, a reverse engineer would start by digging deeper into this and seeing, you know, what is the control flow path to this that ultimately leads to the exploitable function. So in short, the attacker is trying to figure out how to wind their way with acid through to the draw switch window highlight, uh, because that's what the original description said here. And they know that they think it's gonna go through paint switch window. And so I'm going to use this little diagram here to give you a sense of like where we are as acid flows through this control flow. So there's gonna be a call to NT user message call, and then it calls through to other functions to ultimately get to draw switch window highlight. So this is Piotr's first cut of the exploit. He basically has an H instance that he gets from get module handle. The H instance is passed into this WCX, the window class X, Sets it there, sets some size, sets the class name to exploit window, and then takes the WCX, passes it into register class X. That does the registration of the window. And then later on down here, he can now call create window with the name exploit window, which was used up here. And then the H instance is also passed down there. But you can see the rest of this is all null because at this point, it's just throw whatever in there and see what actually happens in the debugger when you are reverse engineering the code. And finally, that exploit window coming back from create window X goes into the NT user message call, which he knows is the thing that will eventually make its way to the vulnerability. Now he passes in this value 14 because he can see that that was used in the original exploit and then also this value E0. So although this is undocumented, the presumed prototype is as follows and therefore that 14 and the E0 which were passed in, 14 is going to be the message and E0 is going to be the type. So now we're gonna go with the acid flow and see what happens in the kernel here. So now we're in the kernel at the kernel side NT user message call, and we've got the message is acid, which was set to 14, that taints this message one. Then this code right here is basically doing some windows and type sanity checks. So that type, that E0 that was passed in, there's some checks, is it equal to 2B7 or 2B8? No, it wasn't. He set it to E0. And then the validate hwind just returns a clean and validated window object. Further down the code, message is still 14. And so setting that, that would not go into this code. Therefore, it hits the else statement. And then now we have if message is less than 400, which is true, then it's going to call this right here. And so this is just a very complicated, decompiled looking version of a function pointer call. And so there's some sort of table lookup based on the number of the message and these sort of calculations. But this sort of thing is obviously easier to look at in a debugger because you can basically just see, okay, this is going to jump through to this function that is called NT user function D word. At this point, you're in NT user function D word. And I want to caution and caveat that uh, the Microsoft symbols say that the address for NT user function D 
uh, NC destroy and NT user function dword are at the exact same address. So don't get thrown off by the fact that he chose to call call the thing or use the thing for NT user function NC destroy here, even though elsewhere he said, or at least the Kaspersky thing said that it was going to NT user function dword. So don't let the different names, they're the same thing. Don't let it fool you. But the parameters that were passed in were the window and the message. And then here's the sort of decompiled parameters. You can see those don't actually match the uh, the previous thing, which looked like it was only taking two function, uh, two parameters. But that again just is coming down to you know vagaries of decompilation, not necessarily always seeing all the parameters of a function. Anyways, attacker controlled message 14, attacker controlled type E0, type is used for some math. And then what we have here is again some sort of function pointer calculation. So this will calculate and look up a function pointer, which he's telling you here, uh, which Piotr here is telling you is xxx switch window proc. And then those parameters are going to be passed through the clean window and the acid message. So on to xxx wrap switch window proc, which is just a wrapper that eventually calls into xxx switch window proc. Now we're in here, and so there's a question of how do we get from this function where we are right now to the function we want to get to, which is xxx paint switch window, which ultimately leads to the function we really want to get to. So ultimately in this code, we can see that the message is going to be used here in a switch statement. And specifically that 14 that it was using is down here. And that gets you to the xxx paint switch window. So this is where we need to get but we've got to figure out what sort of inputs we need to provide before we can get there. So we've got all these sort of sanity checks up here. So he calls out specifically three sanity checks to bypass, one, two, and three. And then he wants to get to this code right here, which is going to set the FNID to a desired value. So the thing I'll just, you know, kind of jump in right here and we'll come back to it again in a second. This is one of the key sanity checks here. It says if message one is not equal to one, which we know it wasn't right now, it's 14, if it's not equal to one, we get to here. And that's a problem because basically we get in here and we get there and we never get a chance to use this switch with message 14 to get down where we want to go. So it's sort of like we have a problematic constraint in that it needs to be one to bypass this but it needs to be 14 to get to the switch statement. So the way that that's ultimately solved is that we can bypass all three of these sanity checks at once if only we could get this fnid value equal equal to 2a0. Then all of this would be bypassed. And conveniently, there is a location right here that will set the fnid to 2a00. So we need to reach this and then we need to re-enter and we need to now have fnid equal to 2a00 to get past it and get the message 14 processed. So how is the attacker going to do that? Well, message 14 comes in the first time when he's in the debugger. That taints message 1. Windows clean. Window fnid. Now here's the thing you find out when you look in a debugger the first time. That is defaulting to 0 for all new windows. So by default, that will be true. And so you're going to fall down this path to start with. All right, then the fnid is zero again here. So if that's zero, well, that's not going to be true. And that leaves us with this other condition right here. You know, will that be true? We don't want it to be true because we don't want to get here. We want to get here. So how would the, you know, attacker ensure that this thing is not true? Well, we don't know yet, but we'll keep investigating. Also of interest to note is that this one, GPSI of plus one, was one of our OODA locations. So all of a sudden in this function, we've got something that is using one of these uninitialized values. So going back again, right, uh, those in uninitialized values, GPSI plus uh, 154 was one of them. So, okay, well, we don't know exactly how to solve that constraint yet. Then we have the message not equal to one. Well, that's definitely true right here because our message is 14. So that's gonna throw us down a path we don't wanna do. And let's just look ahead a little bit and we've got this wind of extra data. Don't exactly know how to set that equal to false as well. We want to make sure that that is going to be false so that we don't return zero and so that we can ultimately get to this location. That's what we want to do. We want to get this fnid set to this, you know, sassy value, this 2a0. That's semi-attacker controlled in the sense that the attacker wants to hit that control flow set that value so that on the next call to this that he will not hit any of this. All right, so how do we get where we want to get? It's, it's a bit complicated, right? How does an attacker get there? They need to analyze these control flows. Well, the first thing is to recognize that the flow can be achieved. You can get to that switch on case 14 if you call nt user message call twice. 
On the first time, your goal is to reach the condition where it sets this fnid equal to 2a0. How do you do that? Well, it's not equal to 2a0 by default because uh, fnid is 0 by default, so that'll get you into that condition. Then you have fnid equal equal to 0. We want that to be true, and we want this wind cb wind extra data plus 128 to be greater than or equal to uh, this undefined area, this uh, usage of this undefined data. So we want these two things to be true in order to keep going on the path we want. Well, that is definitely and obviously true. That's just true by default. The answer to how to satisfy this condition is that it turns out that the attacker can set the CB window extra value on this window by at initialization time just based on the way that the creating windows work. You can basically set this and it is going to be a length or a size of extra data that will be attached to this data structure. So fully attacker controlled and so they can definitely guarantee set that to something and the question is what are they going to set to, to to make sure that this is true and that'll depend on you know what the initial uninitialized value is but uh, as we'll see later they can ultimately control the uninitialized value as well. All right further along again goal is to set this to 2a uh, 2a0 setting message equal to 1 well that uh, because we now know that we need to call them the NT user message call twice, they can just set message to 1 on the first call instead of 14 and set it to 14 on the second call. And then finally, there's this other thing called extra data, and it kind of looks like, and you might get confused, CB wind extra versus wind extra data. Wind extra is the size of this data, and then this is a literal value of that data. And again, looking at our citation, anytime user space requests extra data by setting a non-zero value for this size, the system initializes the bytes to zero. So you requested some extra data, it will be set to zero, and this particular field is going to be the dereferencing or the value of some of that extra data. So you asked for, let's say, eight bytes, and you get it set, eight bytes set to zero. Now, in reality, um, you know, we have other examples in this class that deal with all of these window structures and stuff like that, but this extra data is normally like a buffer that is appended past the end of this struct, and so Piotr actually just sort of altered the struct definition to imply that there was a field right at the end of the struct called extra data where the real data would actually be. That just makes uh, Ida and the decompilation a little bit nicer instead of dealing with, you know, an imaginary struct off the end of the first struct. So that's not strictly in this window structure. He just did it that way to make it look a little nicer. Okay, so the net result of setting all of these things and satisfying all these conditions is that uh, after the first call to NT user message call, fnid will be set to 2a0. Then you call it again, and on the second time, in order to reach your true target of xxx paint windows, uh, paint switch window, the fnid will be set to 2a0, and that bypasses all three of the previous sanity checks. And then, now your message of 14 will hit the switch statement, and it'll go down and get you into xxx paint window switch. Okay, so that's what the attacker needs to do, so the attacker needs to update their exploit. So now they need to on this window, this window class X, they set the CB window extra to 8 so that it is a non-zero value and it'll request some allocation of extra memory past the end of the window structure. They'll also set, uh, on this first call to NT user message call, they're going to set the message to 1 instead of the 14 from before. And furthermore, he's going to set the type to 0 instead of E0, and we'll see why that's fine in just a second. But you can see it's 1 on the first call and 14 on the second call now. So when the first call is being executed, the message is 1, the type is 0, and the reason that works out fine is because it's type 0 plus 6, ended with 1f. So basically at the end of the day, it's all just going to calculate the exact same function. Same parameters are going to be passed through. Now we're in here, the wrapper passes through to the function we care about. First call, message is 1. Window is semi-attacker controlled. The fnid is going to be 0 by default the first time, and so they're going to fall into this case. They set the cb window extra to 8, so now 8 plus 128 is that less than whatever this value is right here? Well, we don't know exactly what that value is. That's the uninitialized data. So in practice, this is typically zero. 
the attacker doesn't want to depend upon that. Like you should never as an attacker, in the same way that real code shouldn't depend on uninitialized data values, attacker shouldn't uh, depend on it either because it could change and then your exploit doesn't work. So for now, we'll just say it's typically zero, but the attacker doesn't want to rely on that. So later on, they should manipulate that to guarantee that they can you know, get past this check. But then uh, we'll come back to how they do that later on. Let's just assume that for now it's zero and therefore uh, hex 130 is not less than zero and so it's all good. Then they have the message is exactly equal to one and so they achieve what they want and they don't go into that condition. And then this extra data we said is actually you requested eight bytes of extra data. It will be initialized and set to zero automatically at the end, past the end of the window structure, but he declared it here as if it was in the window structure. So that is gonna be set to zero. And so if zero was not true, and so you're not gonna return zero, you're going to successfully get where you wanted to get, and you're going to successfully set fnid to 2a0. Then there's the second call to nt user message call. Now you pass 14, message is 14, window is semi-attacker controlled. At this point, this is semi-attacker controlled. And so it is exactly 2A0. And so you bypass all of this. And now you get down to the switch statement and it is X14. And that gets you where you wanna go. X14 with the window that's semi-attacker controlled gets you into XXX paint switch window. So the attacker has successfully gotten one step further in the control flow. And we have gotten one step further in our understanding. But that was a lot. And quite frankly, there's a lot of the journey left to go. So I would understand if you wanted to pause, take a moment, take a break, grab some coffee, because this is going to just keep going. There's a lot to understand still. All right, so let's pick right back up. We have now successfully called into XXX paint switch window. And there's a whole bunch of other cases and conditions that have to be satisfied. So what are we going to do in this particular function? Well, I'll tell you just as a jumping ahead, what we're ultimately going to do is we want to get this as attacker controlled value. If we set that, then this taints this. Later on in the code, that tainted value will get us here where we're trying to reach. And we've got some clean values, our V5 and V6. And we've got a clean value being set into an attacker controlled memory location. But that's not necessarily super interesting to us, right? If we don't really control what V5 or V6 is, maybe we could do something with it if it had a conveniently useful value and we uh, set, you know, we knew exactly where we wanted to point this to clobber something in memory with this uh, convenient value. But what we've really got is a bunch of uh, clean data being written to attacker controlled locations. But then in this highlighted box, we have the calculation of V7, which is an attacker controlled calculation. And then ultimately V7, which is ACID being written to an ACID pointer location. And that should make you happy. That looks like an extremely good situation for an attacker, ACID being written to an attacker controlled location. But now at this point, I saw a problem, specifically a problem with my Memoji. When I looked at this, I saw what is going on here? These sparkles are like going through my hat. And I said to myself, I said, get your shit together, Apple. What is this? What the actual hell? Now, it turns out I made these slides last year when I was working on Vulnerabilities 1001. That's why it's a 2019 bug, by the way. It was still technically within the three years last year. But anyways, I saw this and I was super upset when I came back to it this year. And I was like, that's ridiculous. But then I checked for my new updated iMessage and set myself a new Memoji. And so I'm happy to present to you the new and improved version of the Star Eyes from the latest version of Apple Messages. So yeah, obviously it was never acceptable for sparkles to go through hats, but they got their shit together. And so it's all good now. Ah, that's so much better. Much, much better. All right. So moving on, we are trying to get here. We are trying to get to writing acid values to acid locations. How do we get there though, right? So we know from the previous exploit, we already set CB wind extra equal to eight, but what other things do we have to get here? Well, this is our target. So we need to get that to be set to acid to go down and do that actual write later on. So we need to get into this ill else statement, which means that we need to skip the if and we have to specifically get into this if. So how do we get into this if based on this? No idea, right? We're going to have to look into that a little bit later. But 
he points out some, you know, hints about, oh, there's a particular bit position, you know, 28 that will yield that. So a little more reverse engineering need to figure that out. This particular case right here, if fnid, which we know at this point will be 2a0, and 3fff, so 2a0, if 2a0 not equal to 2a0, well, that's not true. That's going to evaluate to false. And that's what we want because we don't want to get into this if statement. But that leaves us again with one of these calculations where we've got that uninitialized location, that UDA location, it's using uninitialized data here for the evaluation of 8 plus 128 is that not equal to whatever value is stored here. And we said that typically is zero. So typically uh, is zero not equal to that? Well, yes, that is not equal to that. And so we would fall into here and that would spoil our day because that's not where we're trying to get. So we're gonna need to do something about that here in a second. But assuming that we can bypass that and assuming we can get into here, we also need to further bypass this and make sure that you know we are not going to uh, hit this return right here. We wanna get to this assignment. And again, there's a hint that has something to do with uh, a bit called destroyed. So yeah, how do we get where we want to get? So starting at the beginning, we have to make sure that this check is true. So we want to get into that first if, and it says that it has to do with the be visible bit. And so it turns out this can be achieved very simply in that when the call to create window X is called, there is a flag WS visible. And if that is set, then great, you're going to get into there. Similarly, there is a destroyed flag. And so we just need to not set the destroyed flag to make sure that we don't hit that other case. What else do we need to do? Well, we need to finally make that UDA check guaranteed to pass because right now with that uninitialized zero, that would not actually pass. So it turns out in that original exploit code that was shown in the Kaspersky write-up, there was a special call to create window X with a special name of hex 8003 or decimal 32771. And basically, if you call that special create window X with that special name, then it creates what's called a switch window. And that switch window is normally, it's sort of a system window. It's the thing that when you're on Windows, you hit Alt-Tab and like a window comes up to say, I'm switching between different processes. That's a switch window. But within the control flow in the create window X, eventually it will call this function internal register class X. And it turns out that this internal register class X is one of the places where if you would have cross-referenced the usage of that UDA locations, you would have seen that this usage was an actual assignment usage. And so specifically, this value will be assigned to, drum roll, CB window extra plus 128. So that is the value we set to eight. So we've got eight plus 128. This will give us this sort of sassy value. It could have been set to something other than eight, but it'll give us this sassy value of 130. I'm showing it purple here instead of my typical like, um, blue to red transition. So purple is sassy in this context. So 130, doing all this calculation, boom, 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 a little bit of math, all of that calculates out to GPSI plus 154. So that is the memory location of interest. So ultimately this is assigning hex 130 into GPSI plus 154. So that is set to a known sassy value. So after the attacker has called this special create window X to initialize this UDA location, now for these sort of statements, like in the first call to NT user message call in the XXX switch window proc, what you're gonna have is, is 130 less than 130? And the answer is no. So that'll evaluate to false, which is exactly what we want. And then in XXX paint switch window, it'll say is 130 not equal to 130. And that is not true because 130 is equal to 130. So that'll be false, which again, once again, is exactly what we want. Cool, one more thing to get where we're trying to go. We said that we can control this value right here, right? And that is our target for control flow path. We wanna make sure we get there. We wanna make sure this is acid, it gets assigned to this, and then that will later on be used. Well, it turns out this can be achieved with this special function, set window long pointer. And this is a very nice function that's used in all sorts of exploits, including other ones we'll talk about later in this class. And that function allows just taking a fully attacker controlled value and slapping it into that extra data field that is at the end of a uh, window structure. The thing that's right at the end of it, you know, you say, I want to create a window structure with however many bytes of data. And then later on you use set window long pointer to write your attacker controlled values into that many bytes.
So in there's there's one extra little hoop here uh, having to do with this uninitialized usage. And so set window long pointer in user space calls into XXX sit window long in Win32K in kernel space. And there is a check inside of here that basically there's a failure path that the attacker wants to avoid. So they don't want to get here because it would return an error. So to not get there, they need to make sure that they don't fall into this flow. So fnid less than two a's uh, one. So normally we said we're specifically setting our fnid to two a zero. So normally we would definitely fall into this control flow path. So our opportunity to not fall into that path is specifically to try to target this go to. We want to skip over this and go somewhere else. So we need this statement to be true. We need if an index greater than or equal to, and then this big old chunk of calculation. So if that is true, then we're good to go. We're going to skip this. But if it's not true, then we got a problem. Okay, so when the attacker reaches this code, the n index is going to be set to zero. And as a reminder for why that is, it's because they're trying to reach this code, which has extra data. This is essentially the offset zero of the extra data. And they want that to be a pointer that's going to be moved into this variable, and that variable will then be dereferenced and used for the writes to memory. So n index needs to be zero because they need to write to offset zero of this extra data. And so then when they get right here, it's going to be a check of is zero greater than or equal to. And all of this calculates down to GPSI plus 154, so the uninitialized data minus 128. So if it's uninitialized still, then what that is 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 zero greater than or equal to zero minus 128, and that would be true. But if you had already run the initialization, then it would be is zero greater than 130, the SASE value minus 128, which would be eight. So is zero greater than eight? No, that's not true. So this is interesting because this actually implies that there is a dependency here in this function specifically in set window long pointer that this function has to be called before you do that initialization of the OODA location to 130 because otherwise it would not be able to pass this and it would fall into the error path. So obviously an attacker never wants their code to actually depend on an uninitialized value which could change but it turns out that given the constraints here it is. And furthermore, given the fact that, you know, if you do this set and then later on you do the initialization, that means if you fail the exploit and you try again, well, too bad, it's already been now set to 130. So what does an updated version of the exploit look like? Well, there was that WS visible in the create window X to make sure that the visible check was passed. And then there's that set window long pointer. And thank you, Kate. Yes, I know this 414141 is acid. So in the set window long pointer at offset zero, the attacker needs to put a pointer that will subsequently be used and dereferenced by the vulnerable code. And then there's going to be the creating the special window, which will cause the initialization of the GPSI plus 154 equal to 130. So again, that has to occur after this set window long pointer. So here's what you would see in a debugger like WinDebug, but of course we can't assume that you know assembly in this class. Of course you also can learn assembly by taking the OST2 Architecture 1001 and we also teach WinDebug. So the important thing here is that basically, based on that previous exploit code, there was a crash on the dereferencing of RDI, which is indeed ACID, right? That is why we use that 4141 value. If that starts showing up somewhere in registers, in crash dumps, then we know that attacker controlled input has been used and controlled in some way. Okay, so at this point it's crashing and you don't want it to crash as an exploit, you want it to keep running. So what needs to be set with the set window long pointer is a pointer to a memory location that is actually writable, not just the 4141. And also there has to be that toggling of the alt keys. Here, we know that the attacker can set this, that's at offset zero of the extra data. And so if that's acid, then that's acid as well. And then if that's non-zero, then great, you're gonna get into here, but this is now where there's going to be certain checks. So it's going to say if extra window data, whatever that was set to point to, if that location plus six C is not true, then it's going to go to label 28. And so it'll jump over here and it'll go to this uh, get async key state. 
Otherwise, it'll fall in, do the get key state, and then jump further. And the same sort of conditional check is here. So basically, it could you know hit the get key state or it could hit the get async key state. So the uh, so Piotr chose to use the set keyboard state function in his exploit code. And the thing about that function is that it's only going to show the alt keys pressed when you do the get key state function inside of that XXX paint switch window. So what he wants to do is he wants to avoid the get async key state. And to do that, he needs to make sure that this offset 6C inside of the memory location that he's going to set is non-zero and then it'll skip the get async key state. So the code for that looks like virtual alloc, that's just allocating hex 1000 bytes of space. Set window long pointer is going to use that pointer that was returned by that instead of the 41, 41, 41. And then they've got this key state, 256 byte array. So then he's going to get back the key state into this buffer with get keyboard state. Then he's going to set a particular bit, which will simulate set, uh, toggling the alt key. And then it'll take that key state and just write it back. So it'll look as if the alt was toggled. And then importantly, this pointer right there, uh, the memory that that points at offset 6C should have a non-zero value that'll bypass the get async key state. And then finally, if you do all of those things, you will get a crash in draw switch window highlight, which is exactly where the attacker was trying to get based on the original write-up, according to Kaspersky saying that's where the actual vulnerabilities are occurring. So when the, you know, when Piotr analyzed the crash, what he can see is that it's basically uh, reading, so it's taking the memory location that it was fed, it's reading a pointer out of that memory at offset 20, it's dereferencing that pointer, and then it is writing to locations 58, 60, and 68 at wherever that pointer at offset 20 is. So the way that this can be gotten around to make sure it's not crashing is add a pointer to itself inside the virtual memory at offset 20. And then subsequently when it's doing the acid writes to 58, 60, and 68, then those will be just inside the same buffer that the attacker already fed in. So cool, you get then a memory dump looking something like this. This is, you know, the buffer address hex, what, 100,000? And so if hex 100,000 offset 20 has a pointer back to hex 100,000, then subsequently, basically, it'll pull out 100,000, go to offset 20, pull out 100,000, and then go to offsets 58, 60, and 68. And those will ultimately write attacker-controlled values. So now, essentially, if the attacker is setting this to anywhere else in memory, this is now an acid pointer, and they can have acid values written to acid pointers. So I have to update the exploit one more time, and this is what the final cut looks like. So now we've got that virtual allocation, creating memory, making sure that offset 6C is equal to 1 to bypass the get async key state, then putting a pointer to itself inside of the memory at offset 20, and then making sure to simulate those key presses. So all of that wrapped up inside of, you know, creating windows, uh, calling the first thing to set fnid to 2a0, getting memory set up correctly, setting the pointer to this memory. I should have probably highlighted that. This is now the pointer to that memory, which was uh, configured and, and massaged into the right format. Now setting that to the uh, first pointer, the first location in the extra memory, creating this special magic window, which will initialize the uninitialized data to a value that will ultimately allow them to bypass sanity checks in the second call to NT user message call, which ultimately makes its way to the vulnerable code. And with that, the attacker now has an arbitrary virtual address write primitive. So now we can go back and take a look at the original exploit decompilation and compare it to the proof of concept that was recreated by Pyotr. So we've got, for instance, calls to set window long pointer at the beginning, which corresponds to this. We've got the special magic create window X, which corresponds to this. We've got the toggling of alt keys, which Pyotr chose to do this way. And we've got the final actual triggering of the vulnerability through this NT user message call. So we know now, after having gone through all of that work to understand that this is setting acid data into the extra window data. We know that the create window X creates a special window and we make sure that it's visible so that it can bypass some sanity check. 
We know that toggling the keys ultimately bypasses sanity checks on the path to XXX paint switch window. And then this right here is something that wasn't really appearing in the proof of concept. What this is, is a known but later mitigated in later versions of Windows manipulation of GDI bitmaps as a way to leak memory. So this is something that people just used over and over for Windows exploits until Microsoft finally mitigated it. So this is an info leak vulnerability and it helps with the actual exploitation to know exactly where you're writing in memory. This of course was the per version invocation, the, the second call, you can see that 14 right there. So that's gonna be the second call to NT user message call to cause the arbitrary write. Then again, some more leaks, and then again, some more writes. So basically the attacker just has to read, figure out what they wanna write, and then write. Read, figure out what they wanna write, and then write. So as I said, that GDI bitmap manipulation was a known technique. And then what they also used is another known technique, another exploit primitive, to use their arbitrary write to overwrite the access token, which on Windows specifies what a process's privileges are. And so they can essentially escalate the privileges of the process, which in this case would be the exploited Chrome browser, to become a system process. And they said in the thing system driver process, but I think we just call it system process normally. So I have some links you can Google for Windows kernel token stealing payload. Uh, for exploit payloads, that's typically something that, you know, just is plugged into an existing exploit as the final thing you do. But I put some links on the website if you want to just uh, see some quick examples of that. So now in our completely backwards view of the world, we've covered the exploit. Now, what exactly was the vulnerability? The fact that this GPSI plus 154 which also is, you know, this is the uh, actual name of that. I believe uh, Piotr grabbed that based on some leaked source or something like that. The problem was that that was uninitialized, right? That is one of our words of power. Things that are uninitialized potentially give power to the attacker. So uninitialized by default, and specifically it had a value of zero by default, and there was a dependency on the exploit to ensure that that was zero by default. Otherwise, the particular exploit didn't work. The set window long technique wouldn't have worked because of a sanity check. But given the fact it was uninitialized and given the fact that it took on a value of zero, that let the attacker set acid contents into what should have been a private system window, this switch window, this thing which normally only Windows is creating. Like you're not supposed to be able to create switch windows only Windows creates them. So the attacker could write ACID into this data structure, this extra information for this switch window. And then ultimately this draw switch window highlight performed an OODA, an uninitialized data access on some of the now ACID memory that was filled in with this set window long. And it used the ACID memory as an ACID pointer, and then it used that as a destination for writes. And so boom, that is a write what where. Attacker fully controls what is written and where it's written. So what was the fix for this? Well, as we saw with the patch diffing, the fix was initialize, and that's exactly what we say in this class, right? Initialize everything. Although the thing is, this is a very complicated big structure, right? We can see all sorts of writes, all sorts of places. So it would be an open question, are we sure that everything is actually initialized? I'm not sure. I didn't want to go find out. You can go find out and maybe you'll find some other location that's uninitialized and some other location where games can be played.